David Hirsch, which is organized by the Youth Forum of the German-Israeli Society of Bremen and is supported by the Rosa Luxemburg Initiative of Bremen, as well as by the Partnerschaft für Demokratie as part of the program Demokratie Leben of the Federal Ministry uh, for Family, Women, Seniors and Youth. So thanks, David, uh, for giving us the online talk. Let me just introduce you in a couple of words, and then I will also uh, announce a bit the structure of the lecture today. So David is a senior lecturer at Goldsmith College in London, and he's also found of Engage, which is a campaign against the academic boycott of Israeli institutions and citizens. And in 2017, he published a book titled Contemporary Left Antisemitism by Rutledge Publishing House. And since he was 18, he was uh, a member of the Labour Party and the Jewish Labour Movement as well. But uh, last year, um, around one year ago, he left Labour and uh, he will give us some very nice insights today in how contemporary left anti-Semitism works within the British Labour Movement. And he chose uh, to have him as our guest, not just to listen to his excellent research, but we're sure we can also learn about the German context by listening to information on the British context. So the lecture will uh, be around 45 minutes. And after these 45 minutes, uh, all the viewers and listeners have the chance to submit some Q&A. Um, so please just enter, just type your questions into the uh, comment section on Facebook, YouTube, or Twitch. And just a brief information for all those who don't speak so good English, we will provide you with some translated slides, so hopefully you can then follow a bit, but the whole lecture will come in English. But the questions you submit don't have to be in English, so submit them in German as well, we will translate it and uh, hand it over to them. So welcome, David, and uh, the digital floor is yours, so to say. Wow. Hello. So we live in very strange times at the moment. And uh, for me, the strange time is that I'm supposed to be in Bremen today to talk to you and I'm sitting in my house in London. So let me begin. Um, <clears throat> I want to begin with the really simple idea, which I think is very important, which is that there is an authentically left-wing anti-Semitism. Now, quite often you find people on the left who don't know that, or who don't understand that, or who deny that. And often they will say, look, the left is anti-racist, so therefore if something is anti-Semitic, it cannot be left. And if something is left, it cannot be anti-Semitic. And in that way they define left anti-Semitism as being impossible. And actually that's really the approach that the Labour Party has taken over the last few years. And it's not right. So I've got this quote from Moish Postone, who um, taught uh, at uh, in Chicago, who was uh, unfortunately died a year ago now, I think. They're really interesting and important man. And this quote from him, I think, sums up the authentically left-wing tradition of anti-Semitism. He says anti-Semitism can appear to be anti-hegemonic as a fetishized form of oppositional consciousness. You know what a fetish is. A fetish is when you're supposed to be really into your partner, but you're actually into their shoes. Yes, it's when your passion and your feeling gets taken over by like a thing which stands for the thing it's supposed to stand for, a fetishized form of oppositional consciousness. And th no judgment there, right? You can be into whatever you're into as long as what you're into isn't mistaking Jews for capitalists or imperialists. <laughs> so as a fetishized form of oppositional consciousness, it is particularly dangerous because it appears to be the expression of a movement of the little people against an intangible global form of domination. And left anti-Semitism is old. Um, there has always been a temptation on the left. You know, the left says, 
the world is really terrible and the world looks like a conspiracy of the powerful and there's always been a temptation to embrace conspiracy fantasy and the temptation to embrace conspiracy fantasy is always also a, a temptation to anti-Semitism. So that's the first thing. There is an authentically left-wing tradition of anti-Semitism. There has always been left anti-Semitism and there have always been people on the left who have opposed anti-Semitism. So this fight is has been going on within the left for two centuries already. My book, I think, is the story of the mainstreaming of left anti-Semitism. Really, in a way, it's a little bit autobiographical. My story begins in the 1980s when I was a student and I was on the far left. I was a Trotskyist and we hung around on the far left with, you know, the Trotskyist and Stalinist margins and fringes of the left. And back in the 80s, we were fighting against people who wanted to ban Jewish societies from campus, to prohibit Jewish societies on the basis that they were Zionist and therefore racist. So the fight that we fought on the left against that kind of anti-Semitism in the 80s was very marginal. It wasn't at the centre of the labour movement. It wasn't even at the centre of the student movement. But after racism at Durban, at which Zionism was characterized as the key racism on the planet, after 2001, that kind of left anti-Semitism was coming back and moving towards the mainstream. In my story, first in the academic boycott movement, the movement to prohibit Israelis from our campuses in one way or another, as a kind of, which was presented as a mode of solidarity with the Palestinians. And then to BDS in a more kind of general form, which was the boycott movement and then we fought those movements in 2005, six, seven, eight. We fought them because we were worried that they, if we didn't fight them and if we didn't defeat them, they would become mainstream in the, in the British left and the labor movement. And that's what happened. In the end, those ideas and those politics took the leadership of the left, the leadership of the labor party and the leadership of the trade unions. Let me show you a slide which was from the general election of 2019. And this slide shows polling before the election, during the election campaign. It shows polling of Jews, of Jewish people. And you can see that 6% of Jewish people said that they were going to vote Labour. I remember my dad telling me that in the East End, where he was brought up, in the working class Jewish neighbourhoods of London, he told me no one voted, uh, voted anything but Labour. Everyone was either Labour or Communist. Nobody voted Tory. So in his remembering, Jews voted 100% Labour. And by 1919, it was down to 6%. <clears throat> now, that requires some explanation. One explanation, of course, is that there's something wrong with the Labour Party. The other explanation, of course, is that there's something wrong with Jews. Well, <clears throat> so let's have a look. This is a tweet from uh, Stephen Pollard. Stephen is a Tory. Uh, Stephen is the editor of the Jewish Chronicle, the, the big Jewish newspaper in Britain. And this is what he tweeted in the election campaign. He said, as a saddo, sad man, you know, a, a, an anorak, you know what I mean. As a saddo, I've always loved elections. 
even if I thought the party I wanted to win would lose, I've followed every twist and turn obsessively, and I love every minute doing so. Not this time. This time I'm tense with foreboding that an anti-Semite will win. Bloody hell. <laughs> and the reason I give you this tweet is because he wasn't the only one to think that. And it wasn't only Tories who thought that, but many, many Jews thought that. And as you can see from the previous image of the polling. So I want to ask a little bit about why Jews thought that. And then I want to ask about how that's possible for that to have happened on the left. So let me give you a few stories to try to explain what Jeremy Corbyn's politics were. And I want to be clear that Corbyn wasn't the reason for left anti-Semitism. He wasn't, he was never a leader or a pioneer. Corbyn was always a kind of follower of the orthodox, what he thought was the sort of left orthodoxy. So this wasn't created by Corbyn and it wasn't, only about him, but Corbyn's ascension to leadership was was only possible because there was already this culture on the British left, and not only on the far left, but Corbyn enthused many people, and many people went along with it and were prepared to overlook what some people were saying about Corbyn's anti-Semitic politics. Let me give you an example. This is actually quite a well-known example that Jeremy Corbyn referred to Hamas and Hezbollah as friends. And he was quite good at explaining it or wriggling out of it or making it look okay. So he said, sure, he said, I'm for peace. Of course, the communist movement in Britain, I think everywhere, has always presented itself as being for peace. I'm for peace, he said, and I'm for a negotiation, discussions between uh, the Israelis and the Palestinians. So when we have Hezbollah and Hamas in the room, I friends and I was just being polite. That's what he said. And it's kind of plausible. But actually, if you watch this video, which is on YouTube, and you see the second paragraph, <clears throat> excuse me, of what he said, and you read on, you get this. And he's talking about both Hamas and Hezbollah as organizations that are dedicated towards the good of the Palestinian people and bringing about long term peace and social justice and political justice in the whole region. This is Hamas and Hezbollah. Now, both Hamas and Hezbollah are complicated organizations. They are both anti-Semitic organizations to their very core. That's not all they are. They're also other things, but they're also anti-Semitic organizations. And one of the things that anti-Zionism does is it flattens Palestine from a real place with real people, with social agency, with politics, some of whom support Hamas and some of whom support Hezbollah, but some of whom don't, some of whom support Fatah and some of whom oppose Semitism and some of whom support anti-Semitism, everything becomes flattened. And thereby you get this idea that Hamas, which claims to speak for the good of the Palestinians, is accepted as an organization which speaks for the good of the Palestinians. So how is it possible that a man who is, you know, well loved as a person of the left and an anti-racist, how is it possible that he can believe that these two anti-Semitic organizations are dedicated to peace and justice around the whole region of the Middle East? Remembering that Hezbollah, for example, had already been for, for well, now have for years been involved in supplying the shock troops to the Assad regime in Syria. So even if you 
aren't interested in their anti-Semitism, the idea that they're anything about peace and justice in the whole region is really strange. So I'm going to come back to that in a little in a little while and show you how it is that people on the left could look at Hamas and Hezbollah and see allies. I'm coming back to that. This is a quote from Ra'ad Salah. There are many quotes from Ra'ad Salah. He was a political leader of Palestinians in uh, Israel, in, not in the West Bank, but in Israel itself. And here's a quote from him. <clears throat> we have never allowed ourselves to knead the dough for the bread that breaks the fast in the holy month of Ramadan with children's blood, he said. Ask what used to happen to some children in Europe whose blood was mixed with the dough of the holy bread. Now, very often when you have an anti-Semitic statement, the claim is made that this is not an anti-Semitic statement, but it's merely criticism of Israel. So looking at this statement, would it be possible to understand this as criticism of Israel? Well, not really, given that it is a an explicit and authentic medieval blood libel uh, expression. So what did Jeremy Corbyn say about Salah? He said Salah was far from a dangerous man. And he invited Salah to come and have tea with him on the terrace of the House of Commons overlooking the river. And he defended Salah against those Jewish institutions and organizations which said that Salah was a dangerous man. Let me give you another example of Corbyn's politics. He was paid about £20,000 to appear as a host on Press TV, which is the Iranian English language propaganda outfit of the Iranian state. And Corbyn worked for them and helped them to make their English language propaganda. Now, the interesting thing about these stories, and I've just given you, what I've just given you three stories now, one about Iran, one about Salah, one about peace and justice, Hamas and Hezbollah. Any one of these stories should disqualify somebody from being respected in democratic politics. If somebody works for the propaganda outfit of the Iranian regime, they shouldn't be leader of the Labour Party. That's simple. I've given you three stories. One of the problems is that I could give you literally 300 stories about the anti-Semitism associated with Jeremy Corbyn and with, with his movement about the anti-Semitism, which he failed to recognize and failed to oppose. And for some of you, three is already enough to understand the politics of this tendency. But for some of you, 300 stories won't be enough. Do you see what I mean? Let me show you another. This was a mural that was painted on a wall in East London. You can see what it shows. It shows capitalists drawn as Jewish caricatures with big noses and grasping hands, playing Monopoly for cash on the backs of the poor, underneath the symbols of Freemasonry, with the slogan, the New World Order. Jeremy Corbyn looked at that image. Jewish institutions criticized that image and said it's an anti-Semitic image. Corbyn looked at it and he said, no, it's fine. It's an anti-capitalist image. This is not anti-Semitism. This is criticism of capitalism. Later, much later, when it became a story, when he was the leader of the Labour Party, he said, oh, well, I didn't look at it properly. And he changed his mind. Um, you know, and, and this happened time and time again. A, a story emerged that Corbyn had been in uh, Tunis and had laid a wreath 
had participated in a wreath laying ceremony for one of the terrorists who led and planned the operation against the Israeli team at Munich at the Munich Olympics in 1974. And again, he said, well, I didn't know I wasn't there. I was there, but I wasn't involved. And, you know, just sort of brushed it off as, as something that's not really important. These five women are, were all Labour MPs. Only one of them is still a Labour MP after the election. The two on the right, Ruth Smith and Margaret Hodge, for example, were abused in, I mean, all of them were abused in anti-Semitic ways, in misogynist ways, by members of the party, by people who were not members of the party, by whole swirling masses of abuse on Twitter and Facebook and in real life and by post and in meetings and not in meetings. And it's really quite difficult to untangle whether the discourse as a whole it comes from within the party or from outside the party or it comes from the left or the right because it swirls together into one massive hostile frightening storm the quote and i don't even want to read the quote you can see i think there's a translation of the quote is a, a, a sexually violent and misogynist piece of anti-semitism that those two women Ruth and Margaret were uh, had been bought and paid for by Israel, but they were pretending to be Labour MPs. The woman on the left is uh, Luciana Berger, who resigned from the Labour Party. In fact, my resignation from the Labour Party was at the same time as Luciana and Joan Ryan, who's the one in the middle. Uh, Louise Elman with the red cardigan resigned sometime later. So these, uh, by the way, Joan Ryan in the middle is not Jewish, uh, but was a person who took anti-Semitism seriously. <clears throat> and these five women were drummed out. Um, the three on the left were forced to resign from the party. Ruth Smith lost her seat in the election. Margaret Hodge is still there. So... All I want to say is that, of course, there was anti-Semitic harassment against many people, and of course there is misogynist harassment against many women in public life. But the intersection of misogyny and anti-Semitism is a particularly nasty place. It, intersectionality itself is talked about quite a lot, actually. Many people who have seen how intersectionality as a concept has been used to exclude Jews from the progressive movement. Many people think of intersectionality as being a hostile um, idea and a hostile movement altogether. I think that's quite unfair on intersectionality and it's certainly a misreading of what intersectionality was. So the term originates from the idea it was a, um, it was about people looking at the experience of black women in America and it was Kimberly Crenshaw who had the uh, insight the, the, the she noticed she saw that you couldn't understand the experience of black women simply by understanding the experience of women and adding it on to the experience of black people that the experience of black women was quanti qualitatively different. It was a thing by itself. So you couldn't understand, you couldn't just do, you know, racism plus sexism equals um, racism and sexism. You had to understand that the experience was specific. Now, some of the people who use the term intersectionality today have kind of forgotten what it meant and use it precisely in that way of adding up 
different kinds of oppression to find out who's the most oppressed and to find out how oppression works. So they've lost the interesting insight from intersectionality and they found something which cannot encompass, cannot include Jewish women. And um, it's kind of interesting because anti-Semitism is in a sense the most intersectional racism, the most intersectional structure of power that there is because Jews get excluded by anti-Semitism from the normal concepts of our society. They get excluded from class. They get excluded from race. They get excluded from nation. They get excluded from gender. So intersectionality ought to be a really important way of helping us to understand what happens at the intersection, for example, of gender and anti-Semitism. And so I think we ought to defend and re, um, refine intersectionality rather than simply say that it's something that only hurts Jews. Um, the person who I've read the, the very best work on this is Karen Stergner, who's a professor in, it'll come back to me, a, a university in the south of Germany. Karin Stogner, if you Google her. Luciana Burgess said this on the front page of the newspaper, actually, or, or a big headline on the top of an interview with her. She said, I never thought I'd be described on the news as a Jewish MP. And this really resonated with me, actually, because I felt a bit like too, that too. It was it's kind of my experience that I began as a sociologist and when I began opposing the boy, the academic boycott of Israel and BDS, and when I began opposing anti-Semitism on the left and anti-Semitism within the intellectual life of sociology and other disciplines, then I got constructed not as a sociologist, but first as a Zionist sociologist and then as a Jewish sociologist. And this wasn't always explicit, but it's what happened to me. Racism constructs race. So there's all the difference in the world between me. In a sense, it's one thing what I choose my identity to be, right? I might choose myself to be a Zionist. I might choose myself to be Jewish. I might feel my identity in various complex ways. But what happens here is that I get defined from outside and in a hostile way to be Zionist and Jewish. And you'll understand how hostile that is if you understand that Zionism means in that discourse, racism and pro-apartheid and imperialist and even Nazi. So if I get defined as a Zionist sociologist, then I get defined as not a real sociologist. As a, as a you know racist imperialist sociologist and of course everything nasty follows from that so with the analogy you can have a very empowering self-identity as a black person a black woman a black man but if you're walking down a street late at night and white racists define you as black then you're in trouble racism defines race and I was writing a little bit about Alfred Dreyfus last um, year, and it occurred to me exactly the same. Alfred Dreyfus didn't want to be a Jewish army officer. He wanted to be an officer, and he was a damn good officer. But he was constructed as Jewish and therefore unpatriotic and therefore as not a genuine officer. So in the spring of 2016, after Jeremy Corbyn came to power, about a year later, after many, many examples of anti-Semitism from his past and from his present, many examples of him having taken the side of anti-Semites and anti-Semitic movements against Jews, there was a big demonstration, mainly of Jews, against anti-Semitism, and it was quite unprecedented. There was a real consensus in the British Jewish community 
that there was a problem of Labour anti-Semitism. The three newspapers, the three Jewish newspapers in Britain, which normally are in you know vicious competition with each other in the market, shared the same front page, and they said, "United we stand," and they explained why they're afraid of the Labour Party, the party which had been the party which represented most Jews and which was now a party which most Jews felt to be very hostile. And the point here is that there was a huge and broad consensus within the Jewish community. The Jewish anti-Zionists, the Jewish supporters of Corbyn, tried to deny it. They always said, no, no, it's not true. Right-wing Jews say there's an issue of anti-Semitism, but left-wing Jews say that there's no issue, and the Jews are divided. But Jews were not really divided. The overwhelming consensus in the Jewish community could see that there was a problem with the Corbyn movement, but a very few but very vocal Jewish supporters of Corbyn tried to kosherize his politics and tried to say that there was no issue. There was a letter also in 2016, I think, from rabbis from right across the Jewish community. From And, and I should have put in Rabbi Pinter's picture, actually. Uh, rabbi Pinter was a Hasidic rabbi in Stamford Hill who unfortunately died last week uh, from the virus. Um, and the reason I mention is, him is because the breadth of the consensus of rabbis was amazing. So in this consensus of rabbis who signed this statement, there were rabbis who didn't even recognize each other as Jews, let alone recognize each other as rabbis, but they agreed on this. They agree on nothing, but they agreed on this. And this is one of the responses to that consensus in the Jewish community. This is a guy called Pete Wilsman, who was on the leading committee of the Labour Party, who said this in an NEC meeting in the, in the executive committee of the Labour Party, in front of Jeremy Corbyn and all the other leaders of the Labour Party. And he was not contradicted and he was not told, you know, that that was out of order. Let me show you what he said. He said, some of these people in the Jewish community support Trump. They're Trump fanatics. So we're not going to be lectured by Trump fanatics making up allegations without any evidence at all. So I think we should ask the 70 rabbis, where is your evidence for severe and widespread anti-Semitism in this party? Of course, there was a huge amount of evidence. It had been collated for the Chakrabarti inquiry, for other inquiries, for the Jan Royal inquiry, I've given you some of the stories today already. The evidence was building up later on. Reams and reams of documented cases were sent to the uh, EHRC, the Equalities and Human Rights Commission. The evidence is there. But Pete Wilsman never looked at the evidence because he didn't want to look at the evidence. And what does he do instead of looking at the evidence? He says the people who say that there's an issue of anti-Semitism in the Labour Party are Trump fanatics. And you can see the slippage in this quote. And what that does is it defines anyone in the Labour Party who says there's an issue of anti-Semitism as being a Trump fanatic and therefore alien to the Labour movement. A Trump fanatic in the Labour Party must be only pretending to be authentic on the left and in the party. So you can recognize somebody who raises the issue of anti-Semitism as a Trump fanatic, as alien, as an enemy of the left. And then you don't need to look at the evidence because instead you define them as not belonging within the community of good people. This is a, a image of Labour Party conference and I could actually talk for an hour on this image and the next one alone. Of course, a Palestinian flag in itself, in the abstract, 
is a symbol of freedom and a symbol of independence and a symbol of the aspiration to nationhood. But this was a debate about anti-Semitism at Labour Party conference. And the Palestinian flag was waved by the whole of the conference as a response to accusations of anti-Semitism. Interestingly, the debate before this was the Brexit debate and the Labour Party leadership had made sure that nobody on conference floor waved a single blue European Union flag. The Corbynistas were in charge of conference floor, not a European Union flag, but when that was finished and there was a debate on anti-Semitism, suddenly there are 300 Palestinian flags. And if you are there and if you experience it, then you know that there is an atmosphere at that conference which is inhospitable to Jewish socialists. Another manifestation of this culture is that people's credentials, the Labour Party credentials that were given to every delegate as they came to the conference, they had a lanyard, the thing that goes around your neck, they had a lanyard, a Labour Party lan lanyard. And the Palestine Solidarity Campaign gave out these Palestine flag lanyards. And about half of the delegates had the Palestinian flag around their neck. Now, again, you know, my enemies, somebody will say, Hirsch says that the Palestinian flag is anti-Semitic. Ha! That's what he really believes. That's not what I really believe. But what I do believe is that when there is a culture of anti-Semitism, and when the Palestinian flag is mobilized as a response to accusations of anti-Semitism, and when the Palestinian flag becomes an indicator of a whole political identity, then you have a problem. Non-Jews have for many, many centuries been tempted to define who they are in relation to the Jews. It goes back to the birth of Christianity. And to define who you are politically, to wear the Palestinian flag as symbolic of who you are altogether, of what is your political identity, is another thing. And when Palestine becomes a universal symbol of the oppressed, then Israel, of course, becomes a universal symbol of oppression. And not just oppression in Israel or in the West Bank or in Gaza, but universally. Here's a quote from Stephen Salata, who was a professor in the United States of America. It's an amazing quote because it shows the idea that Zionism becomes an, a, a, an indicator not of anything to do with Israel or Palestine or Jewish liberation or occupation, nothing to do with any of it, but it becomes symbolic of everything bad in the world. And anti-Semitism has always held that Jews are at the center of everything bad in the world. Jews are symbolic of everything bad in the world. And this is how Salata describes the problem. Zionism is part and parcel of unilateral administrative power. It lends itself to top-down decision-making, to suppression of anti-neoliberal activism, to restrictions on speech, to colonial governance, to corporatization and counter-revolution. In other words, Zionism behaves in universities precisely as it does in various geopolitical systems. So Zionism becomes a universal indicator and a, an emotional indicator, right? He's not just saying this as a kind of fact, but he's using the idea of Zionism to mobilize you against neoliberalism and restrictions on free speech and colonial governance and all the rest of it. So when you have a politics which is fundamentally a conspiracy fantasy politics, there's always a temptation to use this anti-Semitic concept of the Jew or the Zionist to give emotional content to who is the enemy. I'm going to skip. Oh, I won't skip this because it's very important, actually. So <laughs> I'm going to go back and not skip it, but I'm aware that I'm using up too much time. John Ware, the, the guy in the picture with the white hair, friend of mine, made a documentary 
uh, for the BBC, one of the big flagship BBC documentary series called Panorama, in which he interviewed a whole number of Labour Party staffers who gave evidence about how the cultural anti-Semitism in the party, the political anti-Semitism that I've just been discussing, became an institutional anti-Semitism within the party. And uh, you can find, I think, the whole of the Panorama show on YouTube, but it was very, very powerful and it presented a lot of evidence and a lot of um, eyewitness testimony of how the Corbyn leadership created a machine which refused to act against anti-Semitism in an organizational fashion. So just last week, um, a report was leaked which had been written by the Corbyn Labour Party, by the Corbyn faction in the Labour Party. It was an 860-page report, and it claims to prove that Jeremy Corbyn would have won the 2017 election if he had not been stabbed in the back by the right wing of the party, by the traitors in the party. And I'm talking to a German audience right now, and you will understand the resonance and the importance of a stab in the back myth. We would have won if we had not been stabbed in the back by people who were supposed to be on our own side. And this document claims to give 860 pages of detailed evidence that this is true. And as a response to allegations of anti-Semitism, what it said was that the people responsible for the anti-Semitism were the right, the Labour right. They were responsible for it because they were refusing to move against it from their positions within the party machine. They refused to move against the anti-Semites in order to make Corbyn look bad. So anti-Semitism is presented actually rather like, rather it was, it was a virus that came into the party that was nobody's fault and the right wing of the Labour Party weaponized it and used it against the Corbyn faction. And of course, nobody's read the 860-page report. I have. But I'm telling you that this will be waved in your face from now until the end of time if you ever say that the Corbyn movement lost because of its own internal failings and gave us the Boris Johnson Brexit government, this will be waved in your face and you will be told, no, we only lost because we were stabbed in the back by the right. And notice, of course, that it's not explicitly about the Jews. It's not we were stabbed in the back by the Jews, it's we were stabbed in the back by the right. And that is the nature of Corbynite anti-Semitic politics, that it is not explicitly anti-Semitic. It's not undeniably anti-Semitic. So this image, I think, demonstrates a little bit about what I promised earlier on. How is it that an anti-racist party could believe that Hamas and Hezbollah are in some sense on our side against imperialism? And the picture of the world is actually quite straightforward, and it's a, it's a picture of the world that you see not only in political circles but also in scholarly circles. And it's very simple: the world that the idea is keep your eye on the ball, right? And the real force for evil on the planet, the force that is behind oppression and exploitation and alienation and war and poverty is capitalism, or some people call it imperialism, some people call it modernity. But that's the real global, organized, powerful force. And everything else, especially other forces which are against capitalism, modernity, imperialism, are in some sense on our side. And to the extent that they're against modernity, capitalism, imperialism, they're good. And to the extent that they're not good, you know, Hamas, Hezbollah, ISIS are not good. But to the extent that they're not good, they're not good because of capitalism, 
imperialism, modernity. And of course, there's then another step. Once you've divided the world into good and bad, there's another step to allow Jews to stand for, to symbolize all that is bad in the world. And then you get capitalism, modernity, imperialism, Zionism. And that's the kind of force and the attraction of left-wing anti-Semitism. I'm going to skip over a side, go to Len McCluskey, one of the most powerful trade union leaders in Britain and a strong supporter and a financial supporter of Jeremy Corbyn. And he said this, the row over anti-Semitism within the Labour Party is nothing more than a cynical attempt to challenge Jeremy Corbyn's leadership. So if I said I experience anti-Semitism in the party, his response is not to say, oh, that's interesting. Tell me how you experienced it. Tell me how you understood it. Give me the evidence. His response is not that. His response is to assume that I'm a Trump supporter, that I'm on the right, that I'm in the Labour Party pretending to be authentic. I'm really alien to the movement and my whole work against anti-Semitism is really a cynical, dishonest, lying attempt to silence the voice of the oppressed, to silence the Palestinians, and to smear Jeremy Corbyn and to prevent him from winning. And I gave this a name. It's the Livingston formulation after the former mayor of London, who said this, I think, in 2006. He said, for far too long, the accusation of anti-Semitism has been used against anyone who is critical of the policies of the Israeli government as I have been. So the bad guys are not the anti-Semites. The bad guys are the people who make an accusation of anti-Semitism. Why are they bad? They're bad because they're involved in a dirty, dirty conspiracy to pretend that anyone who's criticizing Israel is really anti-Semitic. So the standard response to anyone who raises the issue of anti-Semitism as the Livingston formulation is to say, I don't need to look at the evidence. I don't need to take you seriously. I don't need to look at your argument because I can just have you expelled from the movement because you're not authentic and you're actually authentically right-wing. And here's two graphical illustrations of the Livingston formulation. You can see one of them. Um, you can see both of them say the same thing. The world is trying to speak out against Israel's crimes against the Palestinians. And this guy with the mug and David shirt and the kippah is silencing the world, the whole world. This Jew is silencing the whole world by accusing the protester against Israel's crimes of being anti-Semitic. And the other image you can see, the Palestinian activist also is silenced by this accusation of anti-Semitism. It's quite an interesting image if you really think it through. So who is doing the silencing? You can see the person doing the silencing is a person whose left hand is Israel and whose right hand is the United States of America. So who is the person? The person, as we look at the image, the person who is me, is neither Israel nor the United States of America, but is the power, the conspiracy behind Israel and behind America, which is involved in a conspiracy to silence the free Palestine activist. These two cartoons are made by a Brazilian cartoonist called Latouf. Latouf won the third prize, second prize, I don't remember, of President Ahmadinejad's Holocaust denial cartoon competition in Tehran, which was organized as a response to the issue of the cartoons of Muhammad in Denmark, you might remember. But Latouf is interesting because Latouf shows a crossover because Latouf is loved by the left, the people who consider themselves 
to be opponents of anti-Semitism, the people who consider themselves to be anti-racist. But Latouf is also loved by people like Ahmadinejad, who is explicitly anti-Semitic and for whom the distinction between being against Zionism and being against Jews is basically just not really interesting. So I want to, to finish by saying something about populism, because it seems to me that in Britain, the rise of this kind of left Stalinist populism could only really have been so threatening and so powerful because there was a crisis not only on the left of British politics, but also on the right. And I'm talking about the rise of the Brexit movement and the rise of Boris Johnson in the end. And I think this word populism is quite useful. I think of it as being related to totalitarian politics, to the politics of the totalitarian movement, particularly in Hannah Arendt's account of the totalitarian movement, which I don't have time to go into now, but I would love to. And the idea of populism goes like this. In democracy, in a liberal democratic state, there is a plurality of people, human beings, right? And they are diverse. There are millions of people and each of them has things in common with others, but they are also unique. And people have different class positions, different genders, different tastes, different abilities, different football teams, different religions, different national origins. There is a plurality of human beings and through the institutions of civil society and of political society and of the state, those people are mediated into a community which sets rules by which we can live together. All right, that's the idea of liberal democracy and it works to an extent and we can be critical of it, but the democratic state mediates between a plurality, a diversity of human beings. The people, on the other hand, the populist notion of the people isn't like that. The people is singular, the people is abstract, the people is indivisible and homogenous and is set up firstly because it's abstract it must be represented by one voice and that's why you get populism as the rise of the strong man and it also creates this notion of the enemy of the people and the enemy of the people is the fundamentally the liberal elite, the liberal establishment. It's the people who are said to pretend that they are for democracy and liberty and e e equality, but for whom those values are dishonest because all they're really interested in is their own power and their own money. So the cosmopolitans, the globalists, the elites, finance capital, the educated, the liberals, the metropolitans, the people in the big cities, those are the people who are the enemies of the people. Let me give you a beautiful illustration of this concept from yesterday. This is what President Bolsonaro said as he appeared in a demonstration against lockdown in Brazil. He said this, the era of roguery is over. Now, it's the people who are in power. A kind of beautiful, perfect illustration of what populism is. Before, in democracy, in the liberal democratic state, it was all a fake attempt to cover the fact that really the people in power were the rogues, the crooks. Now, says Bolsonaro, now that I'm in power and I'm the voice of the people, now it's the people who are in power. And then he said this, 
everyone in Brazil must understand that they must yield to the will of the Brazilian people. Now, again, I'm talking to a German audience, and I think a German audience will understand more clearly and more straightforwardly the menace of this kind of politics and this kind of way of thinking. So that's populism. And I think there was a left and a right version. This was a Daily Mail headline, a big popular newspaper in Britain. And there was a court case about Brexit, actually, that the government, the Theresa, Gay, the Theresa May government had wanted to implement Brexit without parliamentary scrutiny and without a vote in parliament. And somebody went to court and said this would be illegal, wouldn't it? And the court said, yes, of course, this would be illegal. And the response was to, to portray three judges of the Supreme Court in Great Britain as being enemies of the people. And, and again, I'm talking to a, a German audience. So you know the, the um, sim symbolism and the history of this notion, enemies of the people. But this kind of ordinary, mainstream, democratic right-wing newspaper put this slogan into the public domain really without any sign that it knew what it was doing at all. I have a lot more to say about populism, but I think I'm going to skip over some of it because I think we don't have time and I would rather be able to deal with some questions. So I'm just going to give you a little feel for what you're missing. I'll give you this because you'll like this and you're a German audience. This was Theresa May. And as you might have noticed just now, I was showing you the discourse of the anywheres and the somewheres dividing Britain and of course America into the people who are rooted in a community rising up against the cosmopolitan liberal elite uh, with the Brexit vote or with the Trump vote. And of course, anyone who understands anything about the history and the, the makeup of anti-Semitism will understand that there is great danger in defining the enemy of the people as the liberal, cosmopolitan, metropolitan, educated elite. This is the quote from Theresa May. Today, too many people in positions of power behave as though they have more in common with the international elites than with the people down the road. The people they employ, the people they pass on the street. But if you believe you are a citizen of the world, you are a citizen of nowhere. You don't understand what citizenship means. And now I'm going to give you another quote, and it's your job to guess who said this. The clique, people who are at home both nowhere and everywhere, who do not have anywhere still in which they have grown up, but who live in Berlin and then again in Prague or Vienna or London and who don't feel at home anywhere. Well, of course, this is from Mein Kampf. This is Adolf Hitler. Now, of course, I'm not saying that Theresa May is Adolf Hitler. Far from it. The similarity in this populist and the cosmopolitan, you'll enjoy this too. This is a tweet that was put out by the one of the, the Brexit campaigns. We didn't win two world wars to be pushed around by a kraut. You don't understand a kraut is a, a kind of World War II word actually for, for German, for a German. Uh, but again, let me carry on. I'll just show you this as well. This was also from one of the Brexit campaigns. This shows George Soros, who, of course, has become a symbolic figure of the world Jewish conspiracy and the liberal elite finance capital Jewish conspiracy. And here you can see the tweet says the face of the people's vote campaign was Tony Blair 
but his strings are being pulled in secret by Soros. And you'll also recognize this being a German audience as a very hostile trope. Let me leave you with two slides which tie some of this together in a very depressing way. This is from Rosanna Arquette. I don't know if anybody remembers Rosanna Arquette, but when I was 15, um, she was an actress who I greatly admired. <laughs> and this was a tweet that she put out the other day, 17th of March, 2020. I'm still confused. So Israel has been working on a coronavirus vaccine, virus vaccine for a year already. So they knew. Vaccines take a long time to know if they are safe. And Kushner, Oscar, is the main investor in the new vaccine that is supposedly coming here. Obviously, it's kind of incoherent and illiterate, but you understand the point of this tweet. The point of this tweet is that, the, that Israel is behind the virus, Israel created the virus, and Israel created the vaccine already, and Kushner, who is Trump's Jewish son-in-law, is part of the conspiracy and is making money out of it. It's incoherent, it's absurd, but there has been a lot of stuff about Jews and the virus, the coronavirus, Jew world order, and a lot more of this stuff. So things that people are afraid of, there is always a temptation to understand them and to describe them in this ready-made language which gives us an emotionally charged feeling of who the enemy is. And the enemy is among us. The enemy is the ugly pretending to be beautiful and the cruel pretending to be liberal and the greedy pretending to be charitable. So I'm going to stop there. Hopefully we have some time for some questions. I'm going to give you this before I stop because you can follow me or be in touch with me via Twitter, via Facebook. If you go to my Goldsmiths homepage and you scroll down to the publications tab, you can find lots of things that I've written. You can also look at the Engage website which is a huge resource, actually. It's not all that professionally created, so you have to spend some time playing with it and browsing it to find what's in it. And also, of course, um, read my book. Um, thank you very much for everybody. And now I'm going to stop sharing, and um, hopefully you will be able to ask me some questions. Can you hear me, David? Hi. So we received uh, a couple of questions. Uh, I'd like to put two of them together. So the first is, what do you expect to happen with regard to anti-Semitism under the new Labour leader? And the second question is, um, which role do Muslim communities play in or for the left anti-Semitism in Great Britain? And after that, we have right now, I think, seven more questions or so. OK. So look, the end of Corbyn is very, very welcome it, from my point of view. Corbyn personified the anti-Semitism. He defended the anti-Semitism. He was a focus for anti-Semitic thinking and for anti-Semitic politics, and for the anti-Semitic movement. He was nearly put into number 10 Downing Street, and it's terrific that he's been defeated, he's gone. We won the argument in the Labour Party. It's finished. It's great. What will happen next, I don't know. Um, Anti-Semitism on the left didn't begin with Corbyn, and it won't end with Corbyn. And really, I think the thing about the present moment is there's no predicting anything at all. We don't know what's going to happen. We don't know, you know, clearly the virus is an unprecedented time. 
there is going to be a global recession, perhaps a global depression, perhaps something like 1929 and the 1930s. Um, I don't think we can predict anything at all, except that there is going to be economic crisis, there's going to be political crisis, there's going to be sovereign debt, which is unpayable, and people are going to need somebody to blame. It's also true that democratic culture wasn't very strong to begin with. Populism was on the rise. An understanding and a defense of the democratic state was weak. And so I worry about the future. Um, all I can say about Keir Starmer is that he, he is somebody who has come to power promising to change the culture of the Labour Party, and I'm sure that he will. Um, there are, you know, worries about the, the culture that, you know, there's a worry that Keir Starmer himself remained in the Labour Party under Corbyn, fought for the Labour Party under Corbyn, tried to make Corbyn the Prime Minister, sat in his shadow cabinet. All of that, I'm worried about all of that. But I think we need to take the victory when we when we can, and this is a victory. We'll see what happens next, and we'll see what happens uh, in a time of great crisis and great uncertainty. The question about Muslim communities, I'm often asked, and my experience of anti-Semitism in Britain is that the is that Muslim or Islamist political anti-Semitism was not central to the anti-Semitic movement in Britain and was not central to left anti-Semitism. Of course, Islamist politics has something in common with Corbyn's kind of Stalinist, anti-imperialist, kitsch anti-imperialism. They both have a similar view of the world in which modernity, you could add Christianity, capitalism, imperialism, Zionism, are the real enemy, and they are tempted to alliance. So there was an alliance between the Socialist Workers' Party in Britain and George Galloway's um, Respect Party. And of course, there is an issue of political Islam and of, uh, there is an issue of Muslim anti-Semitism, but it seems to me that the political crisis of the left that we've just been moving through was fundamentally a crisis led by white socialists and actually also by Jewish socialists. And there's a kind of very particular importance of Jewish anti-Zionism, uh, which shouldn't be underestimated, which went to great lengths to kosherize um, the biggest anti-Semitic movement that we've seen since Mosley, or maybe bigger than Mosley, because Mosley was never close to Number 10 Downing Street. Okay, thank you. Um, two more questions. The first question is about anti-imperialism. Like, which role does this concept play uh, for left anti-Semitism? And the second question um, refers to the voting behavior at the UN. Uh, the, the, quest, the, the person who asked this question referred to the German context, but maybe you can also tell a little bit about the, the British voting behavior and how like, being hostile to Israel at the UN comes together with forms of contemporary left anti-Semitism. Okay. So look, anti-imperialism is an authentically left-wing value, right? I'm hearing somebody's microphone. Um, that's better. <laughs> Anti-imperialism is an authentically left-wing value. You know, movements against colonialism were things that any democratic person would support. So far, so good. What happened, I think, with Stalinism was that Stalinism created, it was created in the Soviet Union perfectly consciously 
the Soviet Union created this worldview that I described in which everything is divided into imperialism and anti-imperialism. And of course, in the Soviet context, everything against the Soviet Union was defined as, as imperialist. So anti-imperialism moved from being one democratic, liberational element, value of the left to being a single determinative um, uh, feature which which kind of de determined everything else, which divided the world into two, which made every... So the effect of the way anti-imperialism often appears is that the... I, I told you the bad guys in, in this worldview are imperialism, capitalism, modernity. And the way that's op operationalized politically is that the bad force in the world are democratic states. The United States of America, the European states, the European Union. So democratic states become not just something which doesn't deliver as much democracy or equality as we would like, but democratic states become central to everything bad in the world. And it's a kind of inverse, inversion of Marxism. Marxism said that we begin with the democratic state, the political state, the emancipated state. The state is emancipated politically. And, we, and you know, a world in which commodity production becomes normal is also a world in which we face each other as human beings and we make contracts and then a body of law rises up to defend contract and that body of law creates a world in which we all have rights. And Marx said that is the starting point. But Stalinism inverted that and Stalinism said that rights themselves are bourgeois, that rights are a fiction which are mobilized by a cosmopolitan elite to fool the workers. And rights are a bourgeois deviation and democracy is a bourgeois trick and the rule of law and knowledge is a bourgeois trick. So Foucault came along with his critique of Stalinism and he said knowledge is power. And Foucault is a very interesting and sophisticated man in some ways. But when knowledge is power becomes Knowledge is only power. Knowledge is nothing but power. That science and, you know, knowledge is just fake because whatever the powerful say is true is true and therefore nothing is true. Then what does that do to our, to our worldview? And, and you can see with the rise of populism, you can see with Trump, that a lot of the values that actually we are responsible for creating on the left have become Trump's favorite values. So when Trump talks about freedom of speech, he, talk, he calls it fake news. Trump calls a free democratic press fake news. Trump says that the press is a conspiracy to defend the liberal elite which is stealing your money and oppressing you. Where does that idea come from? That idea, I think, comes from us <laughs> broadly, from the, from the left, which always said that, you know, media was part of the state ideological apparatus to bolster and pervert working class consciousness against the real interests of the working class. Freedom of speech becomes fake news. Science becomes power. Democracy becomes a way of oppressing. And all of this is an inversion of the kind of socialist tradition which I would, which I came from, actually. And I began the talk by saying that the history of the socialist movement, the history of the left is a um, history of a, a um, is a history of a battle between anti-Semitism and 
opposition to anti-Semitism, the history of the left is a battle be between democratic liberational politics and totalitarian politics. And so that's the framework in which I would think about anti-imperialism, that opposition to imperialism and colonialism was an authentic left value, but it has been inverted into a Stalinist picture of the whole world, which portrays democracy as being the key enemy. The other question was about the UN. And I think, so this is a kind of complicated question. Lots of terrible things happen at the UN, right? But the UN is a big and complicated organization. Um, the, the part of the UN that's famously kind of awful is the Human Rights Council. The Human Rights Council is, <laughs> interestingly, a place where every state has a single vote. And the kind of corruption you see in the Human Rights Council is analogous to the kind of corruption you see in FIFA, you know, the World Football Body and the International Olympics Association, and all of, and probably the, the World Health. Is there a problem? I've, um, I will just carry on. So, the, of course, the Human Rights Council is problematic. To say that the whole of the UN is therefore anti-Semitic or anti-Israel or problematic, I think, is, is, is mirrors the power of, of states in the world. The Security Council is built with the powerful states as having vetoes, and broadly, except for the except for Britain, of course, which isn't as powerful as it would like to be. But China or Russia, for example, can veto something in the Security Council because they can veto something in the world. So, I would say that the idea of having an institution and a place where every state can sit down and negotiate and talk seriously and having a security council which mirrors the power in the world which may be able to do things which are important this is not something that we should just trash <laughs> any more than we should trash the European Union but goodness me it could be made a lot better like both are from a Marxist angle, but from different angles within yeah. Marxism. So the one refers to Pastone and uh, it is a remark and it says, uh, does this notion of fetishism rather refer to Marx than to Freud as you have suggested? And then the second question um, reads as follows, is Zionism compatible with leftism, socialism and or communism? Okay. Um, <laughs> yes, Postone refers certainly to Marx um, rather than Freud. Um, I don't really want to go into the the complexities of fetish fetishization and reification within um, Marxist theory. It's not my view that left anti-Semitism is the result of a misreading of capital. It's my view that people who misread capital do so for a reason, which is diff which is external to their reading of capital. Um, I think, I mean, I think Moish is really interesting because Moish takes Marxism seriously and he comes from within that tradition and he opposes anti-Semitism in that language and in that discourse and he does it successfully. It does him no good, of course, because the Stalinists just say that he's basically a Trump fanatic who speaks the language of Marxism, just as it was said uh, that the most uh, dangerous Jews in France were not the Jews who were 
who looked like Jews, but the Jews who spoke perfect French. And Moish was a Jew who spoke perfect Marxism. And in a way, I, it makes me kind of angry and it makes me kind of sad that this brilliant man spent a career treating opposing Marxist anti-Semitism within its own discourse and completely successfully, and yet, of course, made no headway. And the reason, of course, is because most Marxism doesn't have any real connection to Marx or any real understanding of Marx. Um, so I'm going to move on. I mean, we see that though also in different places. So there are Christians who oppose the anti-Semitism of various churches, and there are critical theorists who who oppose the anti-Semitism that you find in critical theory. And there are feminists and intersectionalists who oppose feminist and intersectional anti-Semitism. And they do so with great sophistication within the discourses that they find themselves in. It seems to me, in the end, that the critique of anti-Semitism is much simpler than that, actually. It's a very simple, straightforward, democratic, um, approach. In other words, it's not necessary to critique readings of capital in order to critique anti-Semitism. I don't want to get lost in a kind of Foucauldian universe within which the same things happen, but within different discourses, but I'm a little bit tempted by that idea. Um, the second question, oh gosh, the second question was, is it possible to be a Zionist and a socialist? Um, <clears throat> so insofar as it's an empirical question, obviously it is. Uh, you know, yesterday was Yom HaShoah in Israel. Uh, people remembered the Warsaw get Ghetto uprising and some of the most heroic fighters in the Warsaw Ghetto uprising were Zionists and were organized by Zionists and were organized as part of a Zionist movement. So empirically, of course, you can be a socialist and a Zionist. The people, many of the people who built the state of Israel were thought of themselves as socialists. So that's one way of answering a question. The more interesting question, I think, is is there something about socialism which so so let me let me put the question this way right on the one hand you have people who say look socialism is fundamentally anti-democratic and socialism always embraces a totalitarian politics and the closer socialism comes to power the more totalitarian it is and <clears throat> the fact that so many really existing socialist movements also embrace anti-Semitism is just not at all accidental. So you have people who say that socialism is anti-Semitic. Th then you have people like where I began with who say that socialism by definition cannot be anti-Semitic because socialism is anti-racist and therefore anything that's anti-Semitic cannot be racist and it seems to me that we need to find some position in between that so so i'm not satisfied with a position which just says that anti-semitic socialism isn't real socialism and i'm not satisfied with the idea that anyone who embraces anti-semitic politics is just you know pretending is just not a real socialist and we should have all of the socialist principles, but without the anti-Semitism, because I think that's a quite an abstract way of looking at it. And I'm not happy either with the idea, the notion that uh, socialism is necessarily anti-Semitic. So I think we need to do better than both of those positions. We need to recognize the reality and the history of authentically left-wing anti-Semitism, but we also need to recognize the reality and the history of socialisms which have opposed anti-semitism and we also need to recognize that the opposition to anti-semitism has often been defeated and the closer to power a marxist movement comes the more likely the democratic tradition within that movement is to be defeated and we have to take that seriously because it 
I, you know, I was brought up as a Trotskyist politically, and it's not good enough simply to say that, you know, the Russian Revolution was taken over by a totalitarian movement, but that was really nothing to do with us. <laughs> if they had done what we said, it would have been fine. And if they would had done what was authentic, it would have been fine. And it's too easy. So I think we have to take the history of left anti-Semitism seriously. And we have to really work hard to understand it. By the way, a book that I would like to recommend is um, Robert Fine and Philip Spencer's book on left anti-Semitism, which goes back actually and, and looks at what, what they call the Jewish question. And they make an argument, they excavate everybody who's ever wanted to talk about the Jewish question and they show how the Jewish question is, of course, never about Jews, but it's always about anti-Semitism. And that... If you want to understand Jews, never listen to what anti-Semites anti and anti-Semitism say. And if you want to understand what anti-Semites really want to do, then look at what they say about Jews. Okay, I have uh, two, two more questions. One is about BDS. So what is the role and the actual political power of the BDS movement in Great Britain. And the last question uh, is about the role of education and the role of schools in combating anti-Semitism. Okay. The question about BDS is quite interesting. Um, again, it would help if people mute their microphones. Um, BDS was very important in the politics of left anti-Semitism between, I don't know, 2003 to, say, 2011-12, because BDS created a, an emotional movement which was ready to punish Israel and Israelis and only Israel and Israelis for symbolic crimes of Zionism. I don't think BDS has been all that important, certainly since 2015, because left anti-Semitism had something much more interesting to do. <laughs> and what they had to do was to try to get state power, was to try to get their guy into number 10 Downing Street. So for the last five years, left anti-Semitism has had, as I say, something much more interesting to do, which was to support Corbyn than to satisfy itself with uh, trying to create a boycott of Israel. Um, there is lots I could say about the relationship between BDS and anti-Semitism. Um, one of the things I would say about that is that fundamentally it's an empirical question. I'm not interested in proving to you that BDS is anti-Semitic any more than I'm interested in proving that Zionism is racism. What I can show you as a sociologist is that any time BDS becomes good coin in a movement, any time the culture of a movement allows BDS to organize, then that movement begins to... Um, tolerate anti-Semitism and BDS an emotional campaign to punish Israelis and only Israelis empirically tends to bring with it anti-Semitism. The other question is about education. Um, goodness me, it's a really difficult question because left anti-Semitism is a very strange animal. And the reason it's a very strange animal is because it's well represented amongst educated people, right? The anti-Semitism anti is not a mass movement in Britain. It's not a mass culture in Britain. It's an elite culture. Hannah Arendt talked about the totalitarian movement as being a coming together of the elite and the mob. 
and left anti-Semitism in Britain is an elite movement. It's a movement of university professors and trade unionists and teachers and intellectuals and journalists. And so to ask teachers and lecturers to take to be at the forefront of educating against anti-Semitism is to ask the people who are at the forefront of anti-Semitism <laughs> to some extent to be the people who we who should oppose anti-Semitism. And that's one of the key problems of this phenomenon is it's not a mass phenomenon, but it's a phenomenon which has a strong hold within very important parts of opinion forming uh, uh, parts of society. Having said that, of course, you know, the answer is education. If people are serious about left wing politics and socialist politics, then they have to be serious about educating people who are brought into the socialist movement, but they're not. And the, one of the reasons they're not is because they are not themselves educated. So, you know, even really quite sophisticated socialists in Britain cannot tell you about the history of Marx's opposition to Bruno Bauer or uh, August Babel's opposition to what he called the uh, the socialism of fools, um, the anti-Semites of his time, or the hanging of Rudolf Slansky in Czechoslovakia, or the doctor's plot in uh, the Soviet Union, or the anti-Zionist purges of Poland and East Germany in 1968, even sophisticated socialists in Britain cannot tell you the history of their own movement. They don't know. And people that we bring into the socialist movement are taught the opposite. They're not taught to recognize anti-Semitism. They're not ta taught about the protocols of the elders of Zion. They're not taught about blood libel. But they are taught that the people who raise the issue of anti-Semitism are the enemy. The people who raise the issue of anti-Semitism, the people who campaign against anti-Semitism are right-wing, pro-Tory, and they are behind the stab in the back. And what I've always worried about, as a result of the Corbyn movement, apart from the fact that Corbyn might get state power, that if Corbyn was defeated, then there would be cadres of activists educated to believe that between us and socialism sits the Jews, sits Zionism, sits the Jewish community. And of course, what happened in the last election was that Jews became symbolic issues in the fight between right populism and left populism. And uh, it was very, very uncomfortable for many people. There you go. Thank you very much for your great talk. Now we had one and a half hours and we that covered many, many different aspects. So thanks again um, for going online. And I'd like to announce that we will have another lecture at the 6th of May with Richard Schneider. Uh, and have a nice evening and uh, good night to everybody. Thank you. Good night to everybody. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. And people should feel free to find me on Twitter and on Facebook. Thank you. Bye.